And one, two, three. It looks like, should we go live? Let me make sure all the volumes are turned down everywhere. Oh my gosh, already. Rookie mistake here. I got volumes on all my electronic devices, not turned down. Oh my goodness. Hello, everybody. Glad you are here. I am glad to be back. I am glad you are back after taking the week off. It is Wednesday. It is 8 p.m. Central Standard Time, which means it's time for us to hang out and talk about fish. Thank you for being here. As you can see, Joanna's not here, and Joanna's not here because Eli has yet another game, but he's going to go ahead and I'll, he'll play that one. I'll watch it, half watch it on Game Changer. You'll get updates throughout the live stream possibly on how they're doing. It's actually a playoff game. So if they win, they go on. If they don't, they don't. But anyway, thanks for being here. Hope you brought a lot of questions because today it is about answering your questions as it, as it usually is. I don't have a topic planned. It's fish Q&A day today. And it's been two weeks, so I expect a lot out of you that you're going to have some amazing questions to answer or to ask, and I'll hopefully have some answers for you. So, yeah, just want to say thanks, uh, Dave and Lynn and Wendy and James are already here and moderators. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, everybody, for hanging out on a very, well, at least around here, it's a very warm summer day. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be honest, I miss those evenings when we were playing baseball and I was wearing a coat and it was 48 degrees or 52 degrees. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to miss these days when it's last week it was like 99 today. And they're playing on turf today. And the turf is like 10 degrees hotter than a regular day or a regular temperature. So it's well above 100 even at this time of night. So not cool. I'll be glad when more moderate temperatures come our way. So things going on. This Sunday, yes, this very Sunday, the 26th, we will be at the Greenwater Aquarist Society Swap. That is in Joliet, Illinois. If you are in the area at all looking to save money on fish, on shrimp, on plants, on rocks, on wood, and pretty much everything related to the fish keeping hobby, that is the place you're going to want to be. It is one of the few tropical fish, freshwater fish swaps that are still happening in this area during the summertime. There's one this month, there's one next month, and then there won't be another one until September. So it's a great place to save money. I know I already saw some, some comments in the in the comment section in the chat, you know, about saving money. That's a great way because the swaps usually you're getting fish for less than you can find them at a pet store. They're gonna usually be healthier because they have been grown and or quarantined in people's home aquaria, which definitely means you're gonna get a better deal. So that's 26th Sunday, it's in Joliet at the Bird Haven Greenhouse. I put a, a message out there on Facebook and Instagram today with the link or with the screenshot. And then also we've updated the website. So if you're looking to pre-order fish, and again, if you're going and there are fish that you want from us that are on the website, pre-order them. That way you know they're going to be there when you get there because it just depends on when people come in and what they're buying. Sometimes the fish aren't always there if people show up a little late. So just keep that in mind. So that's the story there. That's where we're going to be. Got Aquashella coming up. It's it's real. I mean, we were having meetings about it this last week. It's going to be a lot of fun. So I'm really looking forward to hanging out with hopefully some of you in Dallas at the, in the first week. I think it's the first weekend of August. So Aquashella is going to be a lot of fun. It feels like forever since there has been one. I don't know why. It really hasn't been that long. I guess it's been since February. But it's it just seems like it's been longer than that. So Dallas, first week of August, check it out, aquashella.com. Going to be there too. Videos for the week. What in the heck did we do this week? I don't remember. I know Joanna just put a video out today on her channel, The Small Scape, uh, which is pretty cool. And then on Monday, we did something awesome. It seemed, why does it always seem like by Wednesday? It just seems like I can't remember what we did on Monday, but it was fun. That I know. So check it out. Uh, coming up, we've got the members video tomorrow on Friday. I am going to be doing a species profile of a fish that I've been wanting to do for a while and I haven't gotten around to it, but I'm excited for that. Joanna will have something on her channel, The Small Scape, on Saturday. But really, what I'm looking forward to the most, I think, lately, and I hope you will be too, is we're going to do a fish room tour. And the reason I'm looking forward to it is the fish room tours haven't been, I haven't done one since January of 2021. So it's been a year and a half. And like I often say, people ask, hey, when are you going to do a fish room tour? And what I often say is, 
if I were to do them, like when I first started the channel, we would do them every quarter and then we start doing them twice a year and then it was once a year. And the reason for that is I don't get rid of fish unless I'm purposely bringing them in as Solomon swaps. But for the most part, the fish that I want to keep as pets, the ones I like, I'm not going to turn around and get rid of them and just bring in new fish. And so sometimes if I were to do one every few months, I'd be like, okay, well, I just saw that a few months ago. But I promise there are going to be a fair number of fish that you have not seen before. And I am going to break it up into multiple parts just because I would like, just because it's been so long, it's been a year and a half, I want to spend a little bit more time on the tanks explaining what's happened, what's going on, what used to be in there, and why things have changed. So it is going to be multiple parts. We are going to run these parts throughout the summer. So yeah, I think it's going to be pretty cool. So hopefully you enjoy it. Okay. So that's what's happening over the next couple weeks. I hope I hope it's a lot of fun. Uh, let's see here. As I think James might have mentioned, it, when we're doing the Q&A, if you've got a question for me, it's always best if you put the at primetime aquatics in front of your question. It highlights it in orange for me. It makes it a lot easier for me to see. So that's just a public service announcement just to kind of help things along. Hip Hop Hillbilly. Peacock Gudgeon. I like them. Don't have any uh, right now, but I really love them. My, my, one of my biggest regrets, I have a few in the fish room. We're just going to go with that for a few minutes. Biggest regrets in the fish room. I had a group of six. I was breeding them in a 20 long. I mean, if you go back to the really early videos in the fish room, I had a group, half a dozen or so in a 20 long, and they started breeding, and I would remove the eggs, tumble them, put them in a different tank, and at one point in our fish room, I am fairly certain we probably maxed out at well over a thousand, maybe 1,500 of them. And they were breeding. They just kept doing that for a while. And they were actually, we had really good luck. We had really good luck with them. And it was pretty cool. So I would like to get some back in the fish room, start breeding them again, because people really enjoyed them when I would bring them the swaps. But I haven't had any for a while, and they're amazing fish. The other mistake that I made in the fish room at one point was I had a strain of jewel cichlids. If you go back and watch my jewel cichlid care video, it, was, it wasn't a very well done video. It was a very old video. I think I was still using my Samsung Galaxy S whatever I had, six at the time. But the strain of these fish were outstanding. I, have, I very rarely see jewel cichlids that had that kind of deep purpley red and I got rid of them. I took the entire group to a, an, a green water auction a, a number of years ago, and I've regretted it ever since. So those were the two where I wish I could I could get it back. Uh, Glenn has a question. First in Buna tank, 75 gallon, how many should I start with? Good question. So first of all, I will I am of the opinion that in Buna tanks are easier to deal with than peacock tanks, peacock sickly, all male tanks. And they just tend to get along better. They tend to figure things out better. And those dominant males, if you do the, if you pick the right fish, tend not to be as bossy as the dominant peacock cichlid. So to answer your question, in a 75 gallon, part of it depends on is your tank cycled? Do you have fully cycled filter media? Are you using new uh, rocks and decorations and substrate or is it old stuff? So in other words, is it a tank that you're just swapping that used to be something and now is going to be a Buna and it was fully cycled with a fairly heavy load? Or is this a brand new tank that you're setting up? Because if it's a brand new tank and maybe you're using cycled filter media, you're going to use something like a Fritzheim 7 to jumpstart the biological uh, filtration. If that's the case, then ultimately, I think you're going to be able to get to somewhere around 22 to 25 in Buna, but I wouldn't throw all of those in there at the same time if you're dealing with a newer tank and the only thing you have is cycled media and maybe some Fritz Lime 7. In that particular case, I would buy them small, really small. So if you can find them at maybe just an inch and a half or a couple inches, they tend not to be overly aggressive at that size. If you pick the right in Buna, buy maybe four to six. Make sure your tank, your water parameters, especially you don't have any ammonia spikes, nitrite spikes, because you're using that cycle filter media. You're using the Fritz Syme 7. Wait a couple weeks. Okay, there's nothing going on. Now you add another half a dozen. Ultimately, like I said, I think you're going to be fine in that 20 to 25 fish range. However, that being said, 
Stay away from the more aggressive Imbuna. Stay away from the Erratus. Stay away from the Bumblebee Cichlid. Uh, stay away from the Demasoni. If you're doing, like, let's say, Yellow Labs, uh, maybe you're doing some Pseudotrophius Solosi. Uh, Sokolofi, I haven't found to be too crazy, and they're going to give you some that blue. The ACI are, are gentle fish, but they get kind of big for a 75 gallon. So you just got to be a little careful with those if you see them. Temperament wise, they fit in fine. Size wise, they might get a little bit larger. I've actually had good luck with red zebras. I know the males sometimes can be a little bit more assertive, but I've found them to be okay in that mix too. So stay with the smaller Mbuna, stay with the less aggressive ones. You should have some good luck. TJB, can I do an electric blue Acara in a 40 gallon breeder? For sure. The electric blue Acara species profile that I did. That group was in a 40 breeder. Now, I did move them out to a 125, but if I just had one, I, I think that's the, probably the minimum size I would go with an electric blue car if I had just a single one. But, uh, there, yeah, that's not a problem. All right, let's see. Uh, connection issues? No, I'm actually showing that, at least on my side, everything is green and good and working, and I haven't had any hiccups in any of my screens, which is a good thing compared to what we had like a month ago. All right, let me see here. The Boba Fetts. Can you have Corridoras in a planted aquarium? Thank you for your time and help. Absolutely. We have Corys in all kinds of planted aquariums in our fish room. Don't generally have a problem. Now, we don't do carpeting plants or anything like that, but for every single standard plant, crypts, anubias, java fern, swords, um, java moss, you name it, like the most of the stuff you'd find at Petco, PetSmart, beginner, low tech plants, never had an issue. Ginger, thank you so much for becoming a prime time or primate, prime time partner. Appreciate you being here with all of us fish nerds. Uh, and I'm scrolling around looking for the little boxes there. Rebecca says, need to set up a betta tank. Can I split a 10 gallon three ways and have enough room for them? I think the most I would split a 10 gallon is two ways. So if you want to put a divider in the middle, then give them each five gallons. I think that's fine. But once you give them like a three gallon space and it's going to be kind of an odd long space, I, I think that would be less than ideal. So maybe maybe just split it in half. And by the way, if you're looking for tank dividers that are that people just generally love, Life with Pets, um, I'm not sponsored by them or anything. I just, I've they their tank dividers are universally loved from what I understand. I haven't used them, but I know that they're they're well liked. So split it in half, yes, I, I wouldn't split it into thirds. I don't know if that's gonna be quite the enough space. Danny B, I want to put some quarries in my betas tank. How do I introduce them to the tank? Would I put them in the tank altogether? That's a good question. So usually with a betta, I like to add the other community fish first, and then I add the betta. And it could be as much as, wait 24 hours. Now again, I'm assuming your tank is cycled. I'm assuming that your tank is large enough for both quarries and a betta. If I was going to do just your standard quarries, I would probably want a, a decent sized group, at least a half a dozen. And I think they do in that number of full grown. I kind of prefer them to be in at least a 20 gallon. Uh, if you don't have a 20 gallon, like maybe like, oh, I've got, I'm going to do this in a 10 gallon, then maybe consider the pygmy quarries. But then again, do them, do the quarries first, add the betta the next day, because the betta is not going to know how long they were there. And it's just, it usually, bettas can be very curious fish. And if you put the quarries in after, sometimes that curiosity leads to a little bit of nipping and, and possibly a little bit of bullying. And as you know, corridors, they, they, they're not going to fight back. They're completely non-aggressive. So they don't even have a, really a good mechanism to fight back. So, I mean, larger fish, yeah, they'll stick their fins out and they'll get caught in the mouth, but that's not what we're talking about here. So, yeah, it, it's it's possible. We've done it a million times. We've got, let's see, Joanna's got, I don't know how many bettas she's got right now, but at least a couple tanks that mix is, is happening, and it's working pretty good. All right, Whips World, thank you so much for the super chat. For the let's bring Joanna back fun, she will, I, I forgot to mention that, uh, as long as we don't have another game, so they'd have to win their game tonight to move on to next week to the next round. There, we Eli's team just skated into the playoffs at the number sixteen seed. They're playing the number one seed. We beat them once, so it's possible we could beat them again. If we lose, Joanna and I should not miss, or Joanna 
should not miss any more live streams uh, for the foreseeable future for any reason that I would know about. Uh, so hopefully, well, I don't know. It's kind of mixed feelings, right? So hopefully they win, but hopefully that a game next week wouldn't be scheduled on a Wednesday because that would stink. They moved the time back. I was going to go there. It was supposed to be at like 5.30 and I was going to go and then leave early and then they moved it to 8.15. I'm like, well, that's not going to work. So Victoria, thank you so much for the super chat. Best tank mates for three P puffers, recommended tank size. Uh, so we got the three P puffers. We're going to have to fix that situation. We'll get you some more next time I have... Uh, I'm in the area and can get some puffers for you. So um, P puffers, what have we kept them with? We have done P puffers in five gallon tanks, which I we had a, a pair. And I think, what was in there with those fish? I don't remember now, but I, I know that Joanna did a video and there was some small fish swimming around. So I, I don't know, there was some kind of a small tetra in there. It worked out okay. Um, if you're gonna keep multiples long-term together, I think at least a 10 gallon. I've seen people do 10 or so, 10 or 12 and a 20 gallon. Uh, might be a little overstocked, but you know, usually a pair for sure is, is gonna be okay for a 10 gallon. I, I don't remember the rule with the pea puffers, and maybe somebody can speak up because I don't wanna speak out of turn but or out of uh, my league here, but I, I thought it was recommended maybe one P puffer, male P puffer per five gallons. I think that sounds about right, but I'm going off of memory and, and it, my memory is a little foggy. Uh, in terms of tank mates, small fish. Um, pygmy quarry cats might work. Uh, smaller rasboras, so like the dwarf rasboras, the emeralds, the galaxies. I know we kept the P puffers with galaxies, with emeralds, with lamp eye rasboras. I think we had sparkling grommies in at one time. What else did we have? Uh, uh, Otosynclus, bristlenose plecos, clown plecos. We've mixed those together, never had an issue. So the, the key with the pea puffers, and the only time we've ever run into issues is when we put fish in the tank that also like to have the snails, uh, especially if you're gonna crush the snails before you feed the, the snails to the pea puffers, and then you've got the other fish that sometimes outcompete them for that food. That's when things can get a little problematic. Uh, Kevin and Lisa, thank you so much for the super chat. Is a 15 gallon Fluval Flex Aquarium okay for shell dwellers? And can you describe how to set up a shell dweller tank? Absolutely. So <clears throat> first question, 15 gallon. Fluval Flex, from what I can remember, the 15 is longer than a standard 10, almost as long as a standard 20, but not as wide as a standard 20, at least not at the ends because it narrows at the ends. That being said, yes, it's possible to do shell dwellers. And when I say shell dwellers, I would stay with the less aggressive ones like the Maltese and the Simless. I would not do Gold Ocelotus. I wouldn't do the Meliagris. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even do the Brevis. But if you're going to do Maltese or you're going to do the Simless, it's fine. I think what you're going to have to contend with in a 15-gallon, uh, that 15-gallon bow front is if you're starting with half a dozen, right? Just so you you want, maybe you want them to breed. You are very likely going to have to thin out that community frequently. In terms of the setup, to me, the setup for a shell dweller tank is like one of the easiest setups to get right. Uh, and so the fish are happy. And basically what that means is I try to keep twice as many shells in the tank as I have inhabitants. So that tends to allow them to move the shells around and everybody's got a space. Now that gets really hard to do. I don't do that in our tanks right now because I have quite a few Maltese in our both our 40 breeder and our 50 gallon low boy. So if I were putting twice as many shells as inhabitants, I think I'd probably have like three straight inches of shells sticking off the bottom of the tank at this point. But at least initial setup, if I was doing like, let's say four, four and a 15 gallon, I'd probably want, I'd probably throw in 10 to 12 shells at least. I like to put some type of, a, of rock work in the tank, whether that's in the center or maybe like you've seen in our 40 breeder, I've got a couple piles of rocks. And I like that because it kind of breaks up the line of sight. It gives the fish an extra area to go where they can feel like, okay, my shells are over here by these rocks. This is my area. The other fish over there have their rocks and their area. And so even though they're not breeding in the rocks, they don't spend a ton of time in the rocks. It just, it provides structure. And most fish feel comfortable around structure. So that's just something to keep in mind as you're, as you're thinking about you know, what you want to do 
with, with this tank. So shell dwellers, rocks, not a ton of rocks, it's not necessary, and sand. Obviously you need sand. And if you're gonna do the shell dwellers, know that they're going to put the sand all over the place, which means I don't remember the Fluval Flex if it's got an intake, because usually those come with an integrated filter. If that integrated filter intake is near the bottom where that sand is, that can also be an issue. If it's near the top, it's fine. But those shell dwellers like to pile sand. They like to move everything around. So just know however you make the tank, it's going to look different when they get a hold of it. So hopefully that helps answer the question. The Zen Ginger, thank you so much for being a member for the last four months. Here's to losing. <laughs> you know what I mean. We just want Joanna back. I understand. I understand the mixed feelings. It's okay. And right now, they are. it's the bottom of the first, and they're down one to nothing. And I don't even know. We probably came up in the top, and I don't know what happened there because I was busy talking with you guys, having fun talking about fish. Mike, appreciate the super chat. Thank you. What are some larger community fish for a 75 gallon? Oh boy, we got some options there. You know, when you start getting into these larger tanks like the 75, I, as some of you know, the 75 gallon is one of my all time favorite size tanks. That's why we've got four of them in our fish room. A lot of options with the 75 gallon. It depends on what direction you want to take it. So you're saying larger community fish. You've got the first thing that comes to mind and it's it's because it's something that we've done in our fish room are rainbow fish. I think I, I really like rainbow fish and they get that kind of semi schooling shoaling behavior going. Like those a lot. Love Congo Tetras. Uh, so, you know, when those males, it takes a little while, but when those males really start to show their color and the finage, that can be striking. So you got the Congos, you got the Colombian Tetras. Now I'm saying, you know, larger, meaning the Congos, maybe three inches, the Colombian Tetras, a little bit smaller. Rainbows can get decently sized. You got the giant, and if you want crazy fish, you've got the giant Danios, which will provide a ton of activity at the top of your tank. Uh, the full-size Garamis at that point, especially with the fish I've talked about so far, are fine. So your golds, your opalines, your blues. I always have one of those in one of my larger tanks. It's just they offer a unique personality. I was watching mine the other day. I've got an opaline in the 150, the geophagus and the frontosa. I know, yes, they're mixed. Yes, it's been working for many, many years. Um, they're quite a bit larger than this garami. And I'm telling you, every morning, this thing, and this garami is getting old. I mean, you're going to see it in the fish room tour. We don't just get rid of fish when they're getting old and maybe they don't look as pretty as they used to, but he's kind of like, I'm a garami that's really old. And he still goes up to those those larger geophagus and the larger frontosis. He's like, what's up? What's up? He doesn't really attack them. He just gets really close to them, kind of looks them right in the eye. Like, you know, I'm the Grammy, right? And they're like, yeah, so what? Uh, this is my tank, right? Okay, whatever, dude, it's your tank. And they just swim around. But yeah, the larger, I mean, the uh, pearl Garamis. In fact, if you want a stunning tank, you could add, I wouldn't do this with the golds, the opalines, or the blues, but the pearl garamis, you could eat in a 75 gallon. You could do 10 or 12 of those easily. And the pearl garamis, what a lot of people don't know is that there's the standards, but then there's the gold pearl garamis, and that can be a very stunning tank, uh, a community tank. So you have those. Obviously, for the bottom, you've got all the different types of quarry cats. I would still, if you're going to do loaches, if you wanted to do that, I don't know if I'd go like clown loaches because they're still going to get too big long term. But you do have like the red tail botias. You've got the um, zebra loach. You could do coolie loaches. So you've got that option. Angelfish, I think for the most part, with everything I've mentioned so far, get along fine. I don't know if I would do more than a pair uh, in, a, in a 75 gallon, but certainly that's worth considering. Um, Severum. They're going to eat the heck out of plants. So if you've got a planted tank, maybe not great. If you're going to put smaller fish in there, probably not a good option. I wouldn't necessarily put them in with other cichlids, but those could work. Electric blue acara could be a stunning centerpiece fish. I mean, I could go on all night, but that hopefully gives you a little bit of an idea. A lot of options. Echo Delta, thank you for the super chat. Do you put any cleanup crew in the Shelly tank? Great question. Yes. So... But it's very limited. So the cleanup crew in all of our shell dweller tank tanks tend to be bristlenose plecos. Best if they are two things. The reason why that tends to work is one, they, I tend to put larger ones in the tank. 
and two there is like i said there is rock work in the tank and so they can retreat into the rock work because if they're out and about a lot and you've got a lot of shell dwellers in the tank and they're they've got a lot of fry that they're trying to protect sometimes they can start nipping at the bristles but i've noticed as long as you keep them kind of give them a place to hide when the lights are on like ours come out at this point at least in the, in the low boy he, we got a big male in there and he's he's out and about he doesn't care fish leave him alone he's been in there forever so yeah it's pretty much bristlemose plecos for us all right i'm scrolling around this thing's about to get stuck because the chat always does that to me chris g appreciate the super chat jason alta fronds or red stripe which is better red stripe um, is that the top of like what? I don't know what we're calling a red stripe, unfortunately. Hold on a second here. Let me see if I can look up. I'm assuming this is a red stripe geophagus. I just want to make sure that um, geophagus. Hold on. I mean, is that is that am I right here? Oh, Cernomensis. Okay. Um, at least that's what's coming up for me is it's 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 the Cyrenomensis that's coming up as the red stripe geophagus. So the question is Alta Franz or they're, they're so similar. They really are. I think either one that's full grown is going to look absolutely stunning. I've had them both. I've had Cyrenomensis, I've had Alta Franz. Yes, there are subtle differences, but trust me when they are full grown and they're showing those trailers and they're showing the color especially if they're on a darker background. You will not be disappointed with either one. That's a guarantee. All right, let me see here. JDM, what would you think of three honey grammies, eight rasbora hats, five quiloches, and a 20 high planted with lots of cover? Yeah, that works just fine. I think that's a good that's a good mix. So you got your three honey grammy. They, for the most part, leave each other alone. The eight rasboras, they stay relatively small. They're going to give you a lot of, lot of color. Uh, in the center of that tank. And, and what's cool is they're going to get that, that that deep color that they get when they're older is really awesome. Cooley loaches for the bottom, they're going to be crazy. They might hide a lot, especially if there's a lot of cover. But whatever, so what? It'll it'll be cool. I think that's a good mix. Mr. Fish. Could you give me a list of non-nippy... <laughs> almost that I said non-hippy. I was like, huh? Non-hippy, deep-bodied tetras that i could also add to my 20 gallon high community aquarium thanks so much i was thinking candy cane tetras yeah we've got candy cane tetras in joanna's got them in what is that tank i believe it's a 12 long with a betta some sparkling grammies a couple bristlenose plecos but some quarry cats are in there too um, so candy cane tetras would certainly be a good option. What else that would be similar? That's not finippy. Besides, like, so I don't know. Sometimes I find the the full grown black neons can get a little bit larger than a lot of people appreciate. And I love those fish. I don't find them to be particularly nippy, and they have a lot of really nice color as well. If you're looking for something different, also consider the dwarf. Um, the dwarf rainbow that gets wide bodied i think that's going to give you the shape that you're looking for they're higher energy but i don't find them to be particularly fin nippy um rasboras i think also i know you said tetras but don't don't discount some of the the, the larger rasboras as well so that could also be an option yeah i think those are some some good starting points David, thank you so much for becoming a prime timer, prime eight, prime time partner. I appreciate it. Thanks for being here. All right, Elready, would you put guppies in with dwarf garami? Keep getting mixed opinions about it. That's because for every person who says they've had it's been okay, you've got a person who says that it hasn't been okay, and that's real life, unfortunately. I'm not crazy about the mix just because the males, they, the male guppies have those long fins and sometimes that doesn't work out particularly well. It really does depend. I, if I was going to do it, maybe try to find a female dwarf garami. They tend to be a little bit less aggressive and less prone to nipping at the fins, but there's no guarantee it's going to work. That's the only issue. So you can try it, have a backup plan. 
the, the reason why you're getting mixed opinions is like I said, because it will work sometimes uh, and then sometimes it doesn't. Like for instance, we've got a dwarf garami in a 20 gallon right now with a bunch of smaller uh, black neons. They ignore one another. Uh, there's some crebenzis in there. They ignore one another. I've got, I believe Joanna has shadow cats, like the little small ones. Um, they tend to be pretty reclusive. They're ignored. But then I've had some dwarf grommies that were absolutely just 100% wanting to run the tank. And it didn't matter who was in there. They were chasing geophagus that were twice as big as them. Um, really back back in the day when I didn't know any better, I had larger grommies in there. They were chasing them. So they can they can be a little bit assertive. Just got to depends on the Try a female if you're going to do that, though. League, thank you very much. Let's see here. Hi, I have four honey grommies in an established community tank with nothing too aggressive. Unfortunately, they spend most of the time on the bottom of the tank and are shy. Is this normal? Um, on the bottom of the tank, not usually. Shy, yes. I, I've had honey grommies that can be very shy. So I'm, I, that doesn't surprise me. The on the bottom of the tank the one thing i would ask is well there's, there's a few things i've always considered garamis in general to be kind of like a tank barometer for me like as when i see them in the bottom of the tank i tend to get a little concerned because it usually means a few things or at least i check a few things right away i'm checking ammonia and nitrite making sure that those are okay because usually when one of those are high the garami are the first one to go right to the bottom i don't know why they do that well i know why but it's just, it's it's really a useful fish to have in a tank if something's wrong. Water temperature, when it starts cooling off, they will tend to go to the bottom. If there's too much flow in the aquarium, they will go to the bottom as well. If they're eating just fine and they're okay other than being shy, then it might just be a matter of, you said they're, they're in a tank, nothing too aggressive. So they're not, they're probably not being, especially if they're at the bottom, usually, if a garami is being bullied, they're trying to hide behind stuff or they're up in a corner. At least that's that's my experience. That's how they act when they're being bullied. So just check those other things and make sure there's nothing going on there. All right, let me see here. Fish fam, 20 gallon long, what's up? Gentlemen, you can't fight in here. This is a war room. What movie? I was going to say war games, but I, I, I don't remember that being a line in war games. But I'm going to throw that out there. It's probably not right. Chris G, do you have to have sand substrate for geophagus? Do you have to, have to, have to? No. Is it the best thing to do for them? Yes. Uh, so right now, I would say, all right, I've probably kept at least 10 different species of geophagus. Probably, I mean, my geophagus altifrons has been on gravel its, ent its entire life, and that's now got to be seven or eight years. Right now, I have seven geophagus um, dichrososter in that 75 gallon that's got gravel again not ideal i would if i'm going to set up a tank for geophagus it's always going to be on sand like my top hosts were on sand the brazilianzas were on sand my certamenses were on sand i just uh, most of the time if i'm going to purposely set up a tank for geophagus it, i'm going to make try to make sure that i can get them on sand but definitely a good thing to do because you you do miss some of their their sifting behavior. So when they're on sand, that they're definitely happiest. You can see them sifting through the sand and the stuff's flying out their gills and they're spitting it out. Small gravel, I found that they kind of do the same thing. They just spit the gravel out. But I've never ever, and maybe some of you have, and I'm not discounting that, but I've kept geophagus for, I, I don't know, maybe 15 years and I've never had them have a problem because they were on gravel. It's not ideal. I'm not saying do that. I'm saying if you're setting up a tank, do it on sand. However, I, I personally haven't had a problem. Uh, Disney fan, do you need to quarantine a snail? I don't. Uh, I've never had an issue with snails bringing anything. So they're not going to get ick. They're not gonna, unless like the ick parasite just happened to be on their bodies, and then they, I don't know, they wind up in the tank and they release an ick infestation, but they don't get infected with it. The only caveat to that is if the snail was bred outdoors which you may or may not know depending on where they're coming from then yeah i i might quarantine them if they've been outside just because there are some parasites that use snails as an intermediate where they might go from 
snails to fish to birds or some type of, of, of mammal and then back to the snail again. And so in that particular case, if I know they've been outside, I might not throw them right in the tank. But if they were bred indoors, I worry a lot less about it. All right, let me see. Corey says, between a ruby tetra and ember tetra and super red phantom, which is reddest. I find the emperors not to be red. I think that they are orange, deep orange. Uh, the super red phantoms, I haven't kept them. I've seen them when I go to the various places I go to for fish. I like them. I also don't think that they are extremely red. They're, they're cool looking. I would say the ruby tetra is probably the reddest of the three, but I would also say I'm partial to the ember tetras just overall for their looks. But if you're looking for a redder fish, the ruby, or if you're the other one to consider, if you if you really want a red fish, like the uh, Harlequin Rasbora would be super red, uh, the red minor tetra, but they get a little fit nippy would be another one to consider. Uh, that's a really red type of tetra. And I just had another one pop into my brain and then pop right back out. Dang it. Well, I'll think of it at some point. Uh, Cyrus says, what is the best way to breed Leptosoma and Maltese in a tank? So we're trying to keep them together, right? There's probably not going to be a best way. Well, the best way is you've got a big, tall tank. So maybe like a 75-gallon or a 125. So I've kept... Uh, Cyprochromus leptosoma. These are so all right. So those of you who don't know, these are Lake Tanganyikan fish. Cyprochromus leptosoma are amazing fish. They tend to be mid to upper water fish. The males get these blue bodies, yellow tails. They don't get super big. They're not very aggressive. They are. Are they my favorite Lake Tanganyikan fish? They're pretty darn close to it. Been breeding them in a 40 breeder for years and years. I keep them with brevis, shell dwellers. Now, brevis are a little bit more assertive than the Maltese and the Similis, and the brevis themselves will sometimes take care of their own fry. So in that tank, I have produced hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Cyprochromus fry. That same tank has produced three or four brevis fry the entire time, and I've had those fish together forever, and that's pretty much what's happened. So that being said, I, I am... 95% sure the, the full-grown Cyprochromus are really fast and they're very capable of picking off the little shell dwellers. And I suspect that's probably what's happening in that tank. But because the Cyprochromus spit out such large fry, they're too large for most of the shell dwellers to even try to bother with. So you'd probably wind up with that situation where the, the Cyps will eat the shell dweller fry, but the Cyprochromus fry will probably survive better. If I were really trying to maximize fry survival, I don't keep them together. Matthew says, why is my bristlenose chasing my Bolivian ram? I have had both of them for about 10 months. This is a recent problem. Your bristlenose could be, well, they can get territorial, especially if it's a male. Uh, two, also depends on the size of the tank. So I don't know what size tank, but you know, if it's like a 20 gallon, yeah, that 20 gallon is probably okay for them, you know, typically speaking. But it's also not a ton of space. So if that bristle nose is starting to get a little bit more assertive and like, hey, this is my space. Maybe this is just a simple thing where this is where the food tends to be at the bottom. And then the bristle nose is like, hey, I know when he drops that food down there, it's going to go right here into this part of the tank. I'm getting my fill before this other guy does. That could be why as well. Uh, so the way to deal with that is make sure your bristle nose has got a full belly. Often what I will do is I will feed the bristle nose plecos at night. If there, I think that there's some competition for food and just hopefully make them a little bit less food aggressive. And if that doesn't work, sometimes you've got to make a change, unfortunately. But hopefully that'll help. Duke says, for the guppy grommy tank, I have a dwarf with guppies, but I only have two male guppies and a heavily planted 20 high. And I'm assuming that's probably working for you. Yeah, I, it just, it depends. It really depends on the fish. Uh, attain? I have a female neon blue dwarf grommy with guppies and platies, no issues. I've I've kept them with with live bears before and I've had no issues. And there's been other times where I see the males are a little chewed up. So it's really hit or miss. Depends. Legion says, what's your favorite tank in the fish room and what's your dream tank? Oh boy. Hmm. Favorite tank in the fish room right now. Let's see. What are you going to be seeing? That would be my favorite over the next couple of months. 
a really good question. I am really liking our 75 gallon. That's got those geophagus um, dichrososter, and it's got the rainbow cichlid or rainbow cichlids, rainbow fish. Uh, there are some snakeskin barbs in that tank. There's still some uh, glass cats. I just I, I really like that tank. It's got the Kessel lights on there, and when it is really looking awesome, like being maintained awesomely, it, I I spend a lot of time looking at that one. There's a 29 gallon in our fish room right now that's got a bunch of brilliant green rasboras with a thick lip garami that is fairly relaxing to look at. We have the 50 gallon low boy, the Molly tank with some inhabitants that I don't think anybody but maybe the members have seen that tank. Uh, we've had some inhabitants in there for like a year now that are some of my all time favorite fish that you're gonna get to see too. So hopefully if they come out, cause I'm gonna have to film them in the morning. Like I think what I'm gonna do is tomorrow morning when I go down to the feed, I'm gonna bring the camera down because the fish that are in that 50 gallon low boy only come out when it's time to eat and then they go back into the plants in the center and I never see them the rest of the day. So it's gonna be tricky. So yeah, those are definitely some of my favorites right now. B101, Jason, it took me seven months to get my brevis to breed. I had to put them, I had to put their light on a timer, change their substrate so the pH and GH were exact and make sure the temp is warm. Oh yeah, for sure. They breed, it's just, the I, like every once in a while I see some fry and then they go away. So I know that they're breeding in there. It's just a matter of the fry are not surviving. And I've got, I've now moved a group to another tank so that I'm hoping I can get some breeding from that group. Uh, Danny says, thoughts on planting a tiger lotus in a 10-gallon tank? I wish Joanna was here for that question. Or Victoria, if she's still here, she's got tiger lotuses in a couple of her tanks. And I thought they get pretty big. So at least my spidey senses are telling me that it might fill up most of that 10-gallon tank. It might be too big. So, But I am not a plant expert. And my spidey senses, when it comes to plants, could be very, very ill-informed. Just know that. David, do you have any tips to strengthen waterproof or slash waterproof a 125 gallon particle board stand? My research takes me to applying an oil-based polyurethane layer. Also, do you have any 125 gallon tanks? Yes, we have four of them. Uh, for those four tanks, I they're on double stands, believe it or not, and I built those out of, so the entire top row or top shelf is out of two by, I'd have to go back and look at the video. I actually did a video on how to build a double stand out of wood for 125s. I'm fairly certain I either did, it's at least two by eights. It might even be two by tens at the top. The supports and the bottom are all two by six and the bottom tank has got center supports. They're basically built so you could park a car on them. The particle board stuff, I have one of those. So the 150 is the only fish tank stand in our fish room that was like a store-bought stand. It came with a tank. I thought about building a stand for it, and it's just the thought of breaking down the 150. I've already done it once to change out the substrate, to do that again, put the tank on the floor, and the tank was pretty heavy, build the stand, put it back up. For right now, it's just not worth it. But as far as strengthening it, I don't know. I am not a, a woodsman worker other than just rough carpentry uh, building stands. So I, I, yeah, those particle board stands that can be, I remember the first time I filled up that 150 when I got it home, you know, it was just, a, it was like the pet smart, you know, thing where you get the tank, you get the stand. At that point, it was an under gravel filter, the light. And I remember thinking, there is no way this stand is going to hold 1,500 pounds. It's impossible. How is this going to work? And I remember being very, very nervous about that stand. And here we are, I don't know how many years, at least 15 years later, maybe more, and it's still fine. But I don't know how to strengthen it. I think if you're really concerned and it's keeping you up at night, dude, just either build one or have one made so that you can sleep at night and not have to worry about it. Nanners, been a member for four months. That's really cool. Thank you. Hello, sir. What are your thoughts on mixing Tanganyikan and Malawi fish? Thank you for everything. Well, that's a great question. I've done it a million times. I, I really have. It, it, it's it's not something that I've I've ever I've ever like thought. Oh my gosh, this isn't going to work. I did it in a 150. I've done it in a 75 gallon. 
I've done it in 40 breeders. You just have to make sure that the mix is not, oh, I kept my frontoso with shell dwellers. You're like, what happened to all my shell dwellers, man? Uh, so the trick there is making sure the temperament of the fish and the size of the fish really matter. That's not always easy to do. If I were, I, I don't do it. I mean, I got to back up here. I don't do it on purpose, right? So the times that it's happened, it just kind of happened because maybe I had a peacock cichlid that was being a jerk or maybe it was getting bullied. Usually that's generally the case. Like, man, this thing is not doing well in this environment. Let me put it over here with these Lake Tanganyika fish. And those Lake Tanganyika fish might be things like calvis or compressiceps or some of the larger open water like the cypochromus or the feather fins um, that will sometimes work but i'm not generally putting these hugely mismatched fish like size wise like i'm not going to throw in a bunch of um, you know small shell dwellers in with these very large halves because i would fully expect them to get eaten so water parameters wise it works if you're going to do mbuna you could run into some problems because the mbuna would prefer more vegetable matter where the lake tanganyikans might like a little bit more uh, protein-based foods. Uh, but I, I, I don't know if I would do it on purpose. I've done it. It's worked. It's not something I would be like, yeah, do it. Uh, Chris G, thank you very much for the super chat. Cold drink for Joanna at the game and a win. Well, right now, oh boy, this is not good. They're down three to nothing. It's the bottom of the third. Base is loaded, but they do have two outs. So, uh, yeah. Hanging in there. Again, we're facing the number one ranked team in all the leagues. So out of 40, I don't remember how many teams there were, like 40 or 45. We were number 16. They were number one. And uh, so they're, they're, they're hanging in there. They're playing a good game. Hopefully it doesn't get out of hand. All right, let's see here. Ginger says, lost an Odo last night. Noticed cotton looking something on its face, and it didn't last the night. Should I treat the tank? Don't see it yet on any other fish. Yes, yeah, some of the... Um, some of those fungal bacterial things will take a fish and and basically if a fish is really sick or its immune system is compromised, it will seemingly attack that fish and then you never see it again in the tank. So I don't get totally freaked out when that happens. I do keep a very close eye on the tank. I'm looking for things like cloudy eyes. I'm looking for any other signs of maybe uh, extra mucus on uh, on their on their bodies. Uh, maybe a little bit extra slime, making sure that they're breathing okay, making sure they're eating okay. So keep an eye on them. Uh, I don't tend to go overboard and just start throwing meds in there when that happens, but I am keeping a close eye. And if I start to see other fish that look like they're not doing so well, then maybe you're looking at maybe like a Marison um, or a um, Marison 2. Yeah. All right, let me see here, Rebecca. Does a sponge filter provide enough oxygen for most community fish? Yes, absolutely. Uh, all filters for the most part. So it's not so much that the sponge filter is producing oxygen. It's really not. So a lot of people think because the sponge filter is producing bubbles, that the bubbles are providing oxygen to the tank, and that's not the case. What's happening with a sponge filter is it's producing the bubbles that pop at the surface that creates uh, some tension at the sur some surface tension, and that is increasing gas exchanges, allowing CO2 out and oxygen in. And so that's really its primary role, unless you've got one of those, those air stones that are creating those micro bubbles. I don't really like the way that looks. I don't know if you've ever seen tanks where they have those things that are creating the micro bubbles. It almost appears like the tank is foggy. And in some cases, those micro bubbles might not actually be good for fish. So that's what's happening with a sponge filter. It's just breaking surface tension so that gas exchange can happen. It's the same thing that a hang on back filter is doing as that water is hitting the surface of the tank. It's the same thing that's happening when you've got a return from a canister filter and it's blowing the water around and that's creating surface tension, which is allowing gas exchange to happen more efficiently. So, yep, it's, it's perfectly fine. And not only that for the oxygen, but and I've said this a number of times, biological filtration I, I have done some things that people probably be like oh you can't do that but i did where you'd have like a little ati hydro 2 sponge filter in with like a hundred fish like a hundred uh, bristlenose pleckles for a while i had the 40 gallon breeder that had well over 100 bristlenose pleckles they were probably at least two inches a piece one sponge filter 
work just fine. The only reason I put a hang on back filter in there is because of the mechanical filtration. I want it because the bristles were always kicking sand and stuff and kicking stuff around. Sponge filters are not the best at the mechanical filtration side of things. So I would throw a hang on back filter in there. Still, I still have one in there just for the mechanical side. But sponge filters are, they can handle a lot more sometimes than I think people realize. All right, let me scroll around here. Look for thing. Oh my gosh, y'all. Remember when I said it was sweet enough and they're really hanging in there and as long as they don't fall apart, everything's going to be fine. Bottom of the third, still two out. Now there's nobody on and the score is seven to nothing. Oh well. We can still come back. Our offense is pretty friggin' good. All right. Uh, this is one electric blue Akara, eight to 12 red eye or white black skirt tetras, one bristle nose, three Bolivian rams, and a group of six to 10 panda bronze quarries. Too much for a 55 gallon. So one blue, electric blue car. The only issue that you may have, and you you might not, is just keep an eye on the electric blue car with the three Bolivian Rams and make sure that they get along okay. Just because they're both cichlids. Electric blue car and Bolivian Rams tend to be, electric blue car especially, at least all of ours, have always been very non-aggressive for a cichlid. Bolivian Rams, um, usually are but i've had some oblivion rams that have like had marbles loose in their brain and they were chasing some larger geophagus around nothing bad i mean they were just kind of chasing to a different part of the tank but the other fish the skirt tetras fine there's 12 of them yeah that'll work bristle nose good you could probably put another bristle nose in there just so you can keep up with you know what you got going on six to ten panda quarry or bronze quarry is cool yeah just keep an eye on the on the ram electric blue car idea and the three bolivian ram thing also just in and of itself be careful there because if you wind up with let's say two males and a female the the two males may the dominant male might not want the subdominant male around if you wind up with a male and two females sometimes the pair will push that female off and sometimes they do it nicely sometimes they don't so we'll see mnc aquatics is the movie quote dr strange love oh i know i've never seen that movie so if it is i don't know wouldn't know hold on somehow why did i wind up all the way back up at the top uh lee korean thank you for the super chat thanks for the amazing content always super helpful well thanks for being here because there would be no content at all if it wasn't for all you awesome people that's for sure all right i'm scrolling this thing's going to get stuck and then it's going to go to the bottom because that's as we know a little bit of the chat thing that happens. So hold on. Now it's is it stuck? Stuck? Where's it going? Come on. Come on. Here we go. Now I'm back. And we are scrolling down. Okay. Whip Swirl. Been a member for nine months? I mean, like someone could have had a child in the amount of time that you've been a member. That's pretty cool. Thank you. I have a question. But YouTube won't allow me to ask it. So hi. <laughs> Hello. You going to the swap? Greenwater? I know usually you're a GCCA guy, but I know you've been at the Greenwater one. You just ignore me at Greenwater. You you, you say hello at the GCCA, and then you walk right on by at the Greenwater one. That's okay. Regina, thank you so much for the super chat. Wow, thank you. Really appreciate it. Holding down the fort, Jason. You are awesome. Thanks for all the great information. Well, thanks for being here. I'm glad you're here. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Silver Creek Aquarius, LOL, whips, no giraffe are, wait, LOL, whips, no, giraffe are not a substrate for a nine iron on hole eight. I'm assuming that's golf. Somebody once asked me if I golfed before, and I said mini golf, and I guess that doesn't really count. And I'm not even really very good at mini golf. The last time we went, we went, I think it was Orlando at the, not this past Aqua Shell, the one before it, I lost. I think both of the boys beat me at that point. And there were mosquitoes everywhere. Just remember that. Because it was in, uh, I think we were in Fort Myers at the time. Lots of mosquitoes everywhere. All right, let me see. I'm scrolling around. I am scrolling. Scrolling. Hold on, this thing is stuck. Now they're down nine to nothing. Still the bottom of the third. All right, we got a different pitcher in now. Oh, boy. I think... Uh, I think it's 10 after 5, so that game could be over early. Shannon, how are you doing? 
I just saw some watermelon tetras at a local fish store. I've never seen them before, and I'm curious how they act in a community tank. Have you ever kept them? Let me just see real fast here. Watermelon tetra, because that could be a common name that goes by a different name. Let me look the... So, yeah, it's weird. The pictures are like all over the place. Some of them are really dark red. Red laser tetra. I don't know if I've seen these. So some of the pictures look incredibly striking and some of them look like not as much. They, my guess, just by their genus is you'd want to keep them in probably larger groups than a group of you know, six or something like that, you'd probably want to do at least 10. I probably wouldn't keep them with anything that's long finned. I just, I, that particular fish with that body shape and that face shape just makes me think that they're going to be a little bit assertive. So just be a little careful with them, but they look pretty cool. Might want to give them a try. You guys are going to see some Tetras again. Um, remember saw these a while back. And in fact, I had brought some to a swap that I have not shown. And I've had them for like the last six or eight months. And these Tetras are very expensive. Retail, they go for like 30, 40 bucks a piece. And I've got a sweet group of about a dozen in a 20 gallon. I hope you're gonna like them. Actually, there's two different types of Tetras in there that are relatively uncommon that I'm hoping you will appreciate. Carlos says, breeding for profit, trying to do Hillstream loaches in one and Cooley loaches in another. That's cool. Uh, the Hillstream loaches will get you a lot more money than the coolies. The coolies, I don't know, excuse me, I don't know how much, I don't know how much money is really in the coolie loach side. I, I think that there will be demand, but typically coolie loaches are so cheap at a pet store. That could be a tough one. And I know pet stores can get those fish for not a lot of money, but the Hillstream loaches, focus there. Put a lot of focus there, in fact, because those are fish that, are in high demand. I get people asking me all the time, and at least around here, I, I, they ask me all the time at the swaps, hey, can you get hill streams? Do you have hill streams? I'm like, no, I don't. I'm sorry. I can't find them anywhere. Focus your time there. I, I Do the coolies if you want to, because it'll be fun and you're interested in it, and so that will be that will be reward enough. Hill stream loaches, get her done. People will be very happy about that, I think. Joe! Primetime Aquatics, no local fish store. Where can I get Japanese trapdoor snails? Uh, Flip Aquatics. Flip Aquatics, I think at one point, I don't know, I haven't, I haven't checked their website uh, this week, but they have had Japanese trapdoor snails in the past. So definitely try them out. If they don't have them, then Aquabid. But then with Aquabid, you're always taking your chances because you don't necessarily know, you don't always know the buyer's history and stuff. So start with Flip Aquatics. If they don't have them, then Aquabit is going to be your probably your next best bet. Sunny says FX4, FX6 for 125, question mark. Both are going to be perfectly fine for the biological filtration. I've run 125s on three sponge filters only with cichlid tanks, no issues. The, the issue, no issues in terms of biological filtration. The issue was mechanical. So for me... And part of this depends on how heavily your tank is going to be stocked. But if you're thinking about stocking it moderately to heavily, then I'd go the FX6 route. That's just that's but that's just me. That's how I would roll with it. Soggy fries, soggy fries. I like that. I want to go with a black sand substrate, but too lazy to change out my current play sand. Can I just add the new black sand on top of the established play sand? You can, but it's going to mix. So. It will wind up being black sand with play sand mixed in after a while. But you're not going to harm anything unless you've got a bunch of plants in there that now you're kind of, your sand is going past the rhizome and there's some issues there. But other than that, yeah, you can do that. But just know it's going to mix eventually. All right. Let me see what's going on here. Greg says, do you have a source for buying good breeder groups of guppies and shrimp? And do you have a good uh, have good recommendations of fish for a 10-year-old to start breeding in a 29-gallon? Yes. All right. So 
the shrimp hands down go to flip aquatics that is i think they're like maybe the biggest shrimp seller in the united states if not really close to it uh, i would say most people will tell you that if they've gotten shrimp from flip aquatics they generally do really well i know all of the fish and, and shrimp that we get from them are definitely worth it guppies twin cities guppies i mean that is that is how they built their reputation i know they have a store now in minnesota but I'm assuming they're still shipping shipping guppies, and that's that's his specialty. That's what he's been doing is breeding really high end strains. And when it comes to guppies, you really will benefit a lot from going to somebody who breeds them and not necessarily going directly to a fish store. Because for some people, it's fine. For me, I don't have nearly as much luck buying guppies from a pet store as I do going to someone who's breeding them. We're lucky because we have the Chicago Live Bear Society as part of our groups of fish groups, things that we go to. Tons of high-end guppies at some of the um, other swaps that we go to. But if you don't have access to swaps and, and stuff like that, Twin Cities guppies for guppies, Flip Aquatics for shrimp. In terms of the 29-gallon, check out the video I did. So I did an entire series of breeding for profit and watch the first video because the first video is basically outlining what you need to think about before you get into the the breeding for profit mindset before you get into those setups because there's a lot of things that people don't consider before they start this breeding pro these breeding projects so watch video number one and then you can easily go i think i did a 10 a 20 and a 29 so anything you could breed in a 10 you can breed in a 29 if you breed it in a 20 you can breed it in a 29 you'll get a bunch a bunch of suggestions and I, I tailor those suggestions based on your water parameters which is key so that's why I don't want to shout out a bunch of stuff because if I don't know your water parameters things can change Regina says Jason is the best not too many biology professors and the fish ham certainly not enough well thank you I really appreciate that Regina thank you so much for being here it's one of the things I like to do is is with the hobby kind of incorporate the biology and microbiology into as much of it as I can and it makes it a lot, it makes it very interesting. I had to go to the dentist this morning. I had office hours with my microbiology students and they were learning about how microbes grow and we were learning about biofilms. And so I had to leave office hours a couple minutes early and they, they nerded out and they said, have fun having the biofilm scraped off your teeth because that's what plaque is. I mean, when you go to just like a normal dental cleaning. So I like it when people nerd out about science. Chances. Thanks, Jason. They were 45 bucks each, so I think I'll pass on them for now as buying 10 would, would hurt the pocket a bit. Yeah, so that again, that's like these fish that I have. Um, they're, they, that's about what they go retail. I mean, I've seen them that high for retail too, and it's it, it can be a puff, tough pill to swallow for some kind of a Tetra, and you're like, um, yeah, I don't really want to drop a half a grand on a school of Tetras right now because <laughs> it's really heartbreaking too. You just start losing a couple here or there, and you're like, that wasn't like losing a couple neons where I'm down four bucks. I just lost a hundred dollars because I lost a couple. Not cool. Uh, Zen ginger. Why can't I never say that? The Zen ginger. I found in my research, hillstream loaches are actually not very easy to breed. But if you're gonna do it, species only and lots of sand. Yeah. Yep. Victoria says, I have to go do maintenance on the 175 gallon downtown. Not looking forward to it. The drive is not all that great. Yeah. Going to the city and the city of Chicago from the suburbs, never a good drive. Doesn't really matter what time of the day it is unless it's like 3 o'clock in the morning. But have fun with that. I hope you enjoy the tank maintenance. All right. Um, Sonny, Jason, have you been able to keep any snails with Oscars? <laughs> never, no. I've never been able to keep snails with any medium to large South or Central American cichlid ever. So Severums absolutely love them. The Electric Blue Acara love to eat them. Geophagus will eat them. Oscars will gobble them up. Uh, what else? Firemouth cichlids, like all the Thrichthys genus, because I've had the Firemouths, I've had... Uh, the golds, I've had Makula pinus, they all ate them. So anytime you're dealing with South Central American cichlids, it I'm trying to think, nah, maybe the angelfish leave them alone. Maybe the smaller, like a pistogramma, like the dwarfs might leave them alone. But even some of the, the smaller 
cichlids well you'll see them eating snails too so i wouldn't even bother trying they'll just be like hey thanks for the food man now if you want to just feed them the uh snails for fun certainly they'll enjoy it all right let me see alice b i have a fish that got heater burn heater is now covered I'm using salt to try and avoid infection. Is there any med I should use to prevent infection? Also, fish not eating too. Ah, oh, that stinks. Um, yeah, the Marison, like the, the Fritz stuff, the Marison 1 or 2 is got some antibacterial, antifungal stuff in it. That That's the most likely thing that's going to happen. If it happens, I'm not saying it will, but if you were looking for meds, that's or the, um, the Oxy is another good one from Fritz. I use that from time to time as well. MNC Aquatics, I bought a 50 low boy and now understand why you say you'd never buy another. Hard to find the right equipment for it. Yeah, when I when I did that video, it was more like I don't have the room to buy more. But so with the 50 gallon low boys, I've tried a number of things. So for the filtration, I've got two sponge filters in there. And be, part of the problem is I've got so many Maltese in that tank. When you're running that 50 gallon low boy at any given time, might have 250 to 350 Maltes, and they're constantly picking stuff up and spitting stuff out. So that creates a lot of stuff and detritus in the water. So the sponge filters, the two sponge filters I had were again totally fine for biological filtration. Two sponge filters, three 350 Maltes, no issues. To clear up the water, I will usually leave those two sponge filters on. And then I just did that video with the Oaza, um, the Oaza BioStyle 50 filter. That happened to be the thermo version. That's on there right now. Before that, I had another filter on there. I'm going to do a long-term review on that one. That one was the, um, not the AquaClear, the Fluval C3 or C4. That's good because actually what happens on the other multi, on the other low boy, I've got a Seachem Title 35. And what will happen is as it's pushing up water, it kind of creates a very gentle whirlpool. Not, not, not nothing extreme because the filters aren't super huge, but it creates a very gentle whirlpool. And the, the Title 35s are perfect for that size tank because they don't have the long intake. So I found those to work out fine. This Oaza one that I just put on the 50, you could go small than that. You could put a 30 on there. That will work fine. But do that in conjunction with a couple sponge filters. That works. Any four foot light will work just fine. Lids, if you're going to do lids for the 50 gallon low boy, I use the polycarbonate, definitely use the eight millimeter. Otherwise it's going to sag considerably. And then you can just cut out holes if you want to throw a heater in there or a cord for something else. So it works fine. Uh, if you don't want to look at the, the lid being on there when you're enjoying the tank, just take it off and just make sure you put it back on when you walk away because it's a lot of surface area and fish like to jump. Uh, Chris G, how do the Oscars digest the snails? I'm assuming the same way all the other fish do. They basically chew them up. They'll spit out a lot of this, the, a lot of the hard parts, and then the softer body stuff they just eat, and then the rest of the stuff just passes through their their system. All right, let me see here, Ryan. In your experience, does weeping moss ever bounce back from being yellow? That's a Joanna question. I wish I could answer it. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if it bounce. So I don't know. Because I think she's got it. I just I just have the regular Java moss, and when that stuff starts to die back, it just crumbles. B101, Chicago is the prettiest city in the winter. Yeah, if you like snow and stuff, it's not bad. Some people would say, ah, you know what? I prefer like Orlando or Phoenix or San Diego in the winter. Uh, but yeah, if you're into snow, and I don't know, I haven't been to a bunch of places where it's like snowy and, and big cities type stuff. Oh, Candace says, what would be your dream tank? I never answered that second part of the question. So dream tank, I've always said I tend to like longer, shorter, wider tanks because they're easier to work on. I just find them to be, and I find them more visually appealing. So if I were to, if I had the ability to get any tank I want down in the basement within reason, right? I'm not talking about, oh, well, I'll just put a 10,000 gallon tank in there. Yeah, I'd probably do that. But within reason, I would probably do a 10 foot tank that was at least two feet wide, but only maybe 20 to 22 inches tall. So it would have a 10 foot length, the width of an, a 180, but it would be shorter. It would be basically a little bit taller than a 40 breeder. And that to me would be a tank that I could 
do my maintenance on, I can keep it clean and not have to try to use extra long arms or a, you know, a huge ladder or something like that because that gets to be a pain. That's what I would do. And then the fish, I don't know, I go back and forth because a tank like that, I could put a ton of rock work in there and do like the ultimate Lake Tanganyika setup where I've got the the feather fins and I've got the shell dwellers and I've got and when I say feather fins if you look if you look up Lake Tanganyika feather fins you will see what I'm talking about how amazing some of those fish look and they can get fairly large uh, so I would do something like that maybe do some compressive saps uh, what else would I do probably some rock dwellers like Ornatus and Lelupi and Transcriptus so I could go that route with it or I'm sure Joanna would never allow that to happen and she would do a planted tank and then if I'm doing a plant to take at that point, I think it would be something where I would go nano and I, it would just be insane where it's like, oh, you know what? I like Ember Tetras, but I'm going to put a thousand Ember Tetras in here and then I'm going to follow that up with a, I don't know, a thousand Galaxy Rasboras. And believe me, in a 10 foot tank, a thousand fish sounds like a lot, but I kept 350 Galaxy Rasboras in a 29 temporarily while they were uh, quarantining for a swap and they looked really cool and it wasn't like crazy overcrowded but i would do something like that and then at the bottom be like oh my gosh that dude's got like a hundred quarries just kind of swimming along the bottom there and they'd be like cool quarries like the orange lasers or something like that it'd be awesome yeah that's probably what i do that's probably what i'd have to do because joanna would never let me do a non-planted tank that size all right Victor says, hello, I've got an ick outbreak on my green neons from where I ordered them from. Do you use salt to treat? I'm using salt and ick X with my tank at 82. They are still eating good odds or losses. Well, it's hard to say because it just depends on how advanced the ick is right now. Like if you're just noticing a few spots, I like your odds if you caught it soon enough. The big thing with ick, and I still to this day find myself having to fight this and that is you see a couple spots and you want to wish it away, right? You want to wish the ick away. Like, I know I see a couple spots. It's not ick. It's going to be fine. And then you see a couple more. Like, oh, dang it. Come on, man. So when that happens at that point, you got to treat, right? So the earlier you treat the ick, the better off you're going to be. Yes, the ick X, ick X is good. Be a little careful with the salt, with the green neons. Um, I might not go all that much above one tablespoon per 10 gallons. 82 is good. I think you could get away with maybe even 83 or 84 just to treat the ick, speed up that life cycle so that the meds do a little bit more work. And yeah, I, I think that's, you're doing the right things. That's, that's how I would approach it. Cut down on the feeding a little bit. I mean, if they're eating, definitely want to feed them. But uh, sometimes as the as you're treating them, if they're feeling the effects, they won't eat as much. So don't worry if they're like, okay, they're not eating as much. It, it's it's a normal thing. All right, let me see here. Uh, Sonny says, thanks for answering my questions. Will you be going to Aquashella Dallas? Absolutely. Our plan, so our plan this year is Aquashella Dallas. Uh, we've, we've, those plans are already set. So unless something completely out of the ordinary happens, we're absolutely going. So we'll be there. We'll be at or uh, the Chicago one because that's only about 25 minutes away. That's driving. Uh, I would really like to get to the OCA again this year in Strongsville, Ohio. I really, really like that thing. So or like the event. I just find it fun. It's kind of relaxed. Like that people are selling all kinds of fish out of their out of their hotel room. So uh, that is the plan, at least to be to those three things, and then we'll try to fit some other stuff in if we can. So yeah. Joe says a 10-foot planted tank would look like a rainforest. That's exactly how I would think Joanna would do that. And I'd probably put some some type of higher-end plecos in there just because you'd never see them. But when you did, it would be like the most rewarding thing ever. Be like, hey, man, did you see my $500 pleco right there? Where? Right there. You see the tail right there? Like, mm-hmm, okay, I see it. Yeah, it was worth it. People always ask me all the time why I don't do more high-end plecos. I'll like, tell you why. Because right now in the fish room, I've got two blue phantom plecos and a snowball and then those aren't like oh my gosh those are so awesomely expensive they're not but i never ever see the blue phantom plecos i've actually I've got no i take that back i've got three of them oh my gosh 
I have three of them. I haven't seen the one since I put it in the tank. I'm probably gonna have to go back there and just make sure it's still there. I'm sure it is. The other two I will see maybe once every six to eight weeks. The snowball pleco, however, is in with the albino geophagus or albino hecali, which some of you haven't seen that tank in a while. And that will be a fun one to see as we go through the fish room tours coming up. But that snowball pleco actually does come out quite a bit. It's pretty cool. All right, let me see what we got here. Elephant King, you should make a video talking about burning out in the hobby, how to avoid it or overcome it. That's a that's an important subject. Um, I don't know if I would be a great person to do that video because, believe it or not, I've never really burnt out on the hobby. That being said, I would have no hesitation and will have no hesitation if I begin to feel like the 80 tanks that we have is unmanageable, I will cut them back like that the very next day. Right now, and I say that because right now, the boys are maintaining that fish room. And I fully recognize that there are gonna to have to be some major changes, probably in four to five years, when I no longer have at least Eli, right now Eli, so Luke, Luke 17, Eli's 14. They have been helping me with these fish tanks since they were basically out of diapers. And I mean, it started very, very, it wasn't like, I'm like, here, go clean that tank, little four-year-old. But they would be down there, like in the old days when we didn't have the wastewater system, they would be down there holding the hoses out the window, or they would be turning the water on. Like back in the old days, we had, we didn't have running water in the basement, so the water had to come from the kitchen sink. And so we'd fill it up, and there'd be one person filling, and the other person would be turning the water on and off, be like, okay, and okay, might start filling, then you'd hear, okay, again, and turn it off. So they've literally been helping maintain these tanks since as long as they can remember. Luke has a job, and in fact, in the summertime, he works full-time at this other job, and so that shifts all of the fish room to Eli. Now, Eli's 14. He's been doing it again since he's tiny. He knows what to do, but for him to do the maintenance on all 80 tanks, so he's, well, not all 80 because Joanna does her nano, but let's just say 65 to 70 tanks. He's working quite a bit every week in the summer, and at some point, Luke's going to go off to college. Eli is going to get a job too, where he's going to be like, all right, I've got another job besides my primetime aquatics job. I can't do both all the time and still be able to have like a childhood or, you know, an adolescent hood. And I understand that. So at that point, I'm either going to have to take on a larger role in the tank maintenance side of things, which I don't have the time to do, or we're going to have to begin to automate and be much smarter about how we maintain the fish. And I, I suspect that's the way it's ultimately going to go is I'm going to have to do more auto water change, set up the system. The good thing is I know people who are, who do that and have done that a number of times. But the point is if I ever get to a point where this is not, it's causing me stress, I'll cut back. And so when it comes to burnout to specifically answer your question, and I, I caution people a lot about this is don't turn the hobby into a job. Don't get to a point where I added a tank, it felt good, I enjoyed it, it brought me happiness, let me do that and repeat that again. Okay, the same thing happened, really enjoy it. Repeat it again, repeat it again, because what winds up happening, and I hear this a lot from people, is they start with one tank, now I've got five. They're still really happy. Maybe the tanks are a little bit smaller, they've got the time. But at some point they went from one to five, to 15, to 20, and that all sounds fun when you're setting them up and you're adding the fish and you're watching them, and it is fun, until you realize, oh my gosh, I have to keep up with the fish tank maintenance on these 20 tanks, and I'm supposed to do that on Saturdays because I work Monday through Friday, and now my Saturday is six or seven hours maintaining these tanks. Oh, but I've got to go to little Jimmy's barbecue or my niece has a birthday party or I'm supposed to go out of town for a weekend and now I'm going to miss it. What am I going to do? The tank maintenance. Now you're skipping a week. Now the tanks don't look as good and it just becomes this overwhelming thing. So the point is just don't let the hobby overwhelm you. All right. That's the main point. So to avoid burnout, know your limitations. No. And don't be afraid to admit that. Don't be afraid to say, you know what? I think I went too far here. I think when I went from five tanks to seven, 
that was a time when I just it switched for me, right? So maybe it switches for you from a, of a hobby that you enjoy to starting to create some stress. Don't be afraid to back off. Don't be afraid to be like, you know what? I'm gonna get rid of these other couple tanks. I'm gonna sell these fish off and I'm gonna get back to a point where things are better, All right? So that's often where burnout comes. And also keep in mind, and I heard from an industry expert one time, the average length that a new hobbyist stays in the hobby is six months. That's it, six months. They buy their tank, they set it up, they realize it's a little bit more work or they don't, they're not into it as much. They, that's the people that you see that, hey, my tank is on Craigslist and it's, you know, I'm just getting rid of it, I'm getting out of the hobby. People's interests change. That's okay, right? I mean, if you look back at your life, I'm sure there were things that you really loved to do five years ago that you're not as into. Or maybe there's something new that you want to do. Don't let the hobby that's supposed to be something that is relaxing and enjoyable turn into something that's causing you stress. That's how you avoid the burnout, is being able, being self-aware and recognizing that. It's okay to be like, I need to back off a little bit. All right, let me see here. Cindy says, I love the two paintings on the back wall. Thank you very much. I have no idea where those came from. Jo jo One of the things Joanna likes to do is she goes places. And I think in her head, she sees a painting that she likes or she sees a picture that she likes. And she's like, this is going to look really good on this wall right here. Now, we already have a picture in that area, but she likes to change things out. And then what results in that, a little fun fact behind the scenes, is in the garage, we now have a stack of like pictures and paintings that she likes to cycle through and change up every once in a while. So I don't know where she got that from. Design graphic, hello. I will get some brevis. I'm thinking of using reef sand and crushed coral. Tap water is about 7.8. Thanks for giving me the courage of getting ones from Guatemala, your friend David. Well, that's cool. Yeah, brevis are fun. Uh, I've got a couple tanks with, actually right now there's three tanks that have brevis in them. I like them, little shell dwellers. They're more silvery than the, the Maltese and the Simulus. Got more of a bulldog face to them. So they're cool. Um, I have never used, you're saying, uh, reef sand. I've never used that before because I mean, we're freshwater only, so I don't know how that works. Let's see here. Van Trap, can I keep black neon tetras and angelfish together? Just make sure there's not a huge mismatch. That's the only thing uh, in size. So sometimes what happens, and I've, I've done this a million times, and maybe some of you can relate, when you go to the pet store and you're like, okay, I'm going to pick out these fish. They should be fine. And you get home and you realize all of a sudden the fish that are at home are way larger than you thought they were. And the fish that you got from the pet store are a lot smaller than you thought they were. So yes, they get along just fine. I've kept that combination many times. The trick is making sure that your neon tetras that you bring home are large enough so that they don't get eaten by, let's say, like a moderately full-sized angelfish. Because if they're too small, they will eat them. Joe says, who designs and prints your shirts? Joanna. Joanna does all of the designs. She's, so the chalkboards, these ones here, the, the limited edition 4th of July summer ones that she, all, she does all that stuff. And I don't know how she, she, guys, she has a program. She puts it all together, sends it off to the printer. She, when we first started doing the shirts, I have never seen somebody spend so much time. Like at one point, our entire bed was filled with shirts that she was trying just different brands, different blends, different like uh, fittings because you can get a size large in one brand that doesn't, you know, maybe it's longer than another. And so I was trying on like, it seemed like I was trying on like a half a dozen shirts like every few days till she settled on this brand of shirt and then the design. And she's gone back and forth a million times trying to figure out, okay, how big should the thing be and the colors and she spends a lot of time on it but she enjoys it too so yeah all right matthew does stuff is here what's up glad you're here i'm in sea aquatics how do the tiger limia compare to other live bears such as guppies tiger limia i think are my favorite live bear i really like them so i i just i find them to be so how they how do they compare size wise they're pretty similar i would say tiger limia Females are slightly bigger than female guppies. The males are probably slightly smaller than male guppies. Obviously, they don't have the finish, right? So you're not getting all those different types of colors and everything. 
but you are getting a fish that I just think is unique, right? With the stripes and that green color, there are very few fish, freshwater fish that give you a striking green color. And I really like that, that aspect. The other thing I find interesting with a tiger limia is a lot of the fry from like your guppies and your platies and your mollies, they tend to hang out at the top. The tiger limia fry, you'll often find them at the bottom of the tank, but they breed the same. Um, I will say that it seems like it takes a longer period of time for them to like get into full on breeding mode. We've got them in a 20 gallon, but once they do get in that full on breeding mode, they're pretty prolific breeders as well, but love them. I, I would say they could very well be my favorite live bear. Raymond says, I love the old school primetime shirt. I bought one. Well, thank you. Appreciate it, man. Really do. Appreciate that a lot. Yeah, that was Joanna's first design. That one definitely took her the longest. And if you look closely at that shirt, I don't remember all the stuff that she put in it, but there are like little nuggets of information uh, that she put in that shirt that she kind of draw drew into it, which is kind of cool. All right, we'll take a few more questions and then I think we'll get close to call night that this we're not going to win this game it's 14 to nothing in the fifth if we don't score five runs here and there's nobody out man ran inside if we don't score five runs they're getting slaughter ruled so that's unfortunate but at the same time i'm glad i didn't have to witness it in person as bad as that sounds um, ashley says wanting to start a neocaridina shrimp tank and our water tests are showing very hard water Will they be okay or will, do we need to soften the water? Well, it depends on what is very hard water. Our water is 10 degrees GH and KH. pH is about an 8 to an 8.2. And that works. Eli just hit a double and got a run in. So that was good. Um, so that they do fine. I mean, we've got cherry shrimp here. We've got the blue dream shrimp. We've had the yellows. Uh, we've had just about every neocaridina you could possibly imagine. Right now, we got the orange, the yellows, the cherries, the blues, the black, and they're all thriving, breeding. So, it, if your water is like crazy, are like, oh no, no, you don't understand. It's it's way up there. Uh, degrees hardness is like twenty. Then maybe you might have to add a little bit of RO. But generally speaking, I, I, the neocaridina do better, or not better, but they do fine in harder water, especially relative to the caridina. Nathan says, can you keep goldfish and shell dwellers? Separately, yes. Together, I would not do that because shell dwellers are quite aggressive and they will nip the ever-loving heck out of the goldfish. Goldfish are like, hey, man, I'm just hanging out. I'm a goldfish. I like to eat at the bottom and try to find food every second of the day. I'm happy-go-lucky. Hey, what's biting me? Uh, so that will inevitably happen until... The goldfish get really, really big, and they're like, da, I think I'm going to eat the babies over there. And then there's just going to be sometimes missing fish. But most likely your shell dwellers would destroy the goldfish before they ever got big enough to eat any of the Maltese. So I, I wouldn't do it. Not to mention the fact that the temperatures are completely different. Um, you know, goldfish would, they, they, they don't mind that low 60s, upper 70s, or even cooler shell dwellers. You're going to want them at 78, 80. So... All right, let me see here. Scrolling around, scrolling around. Uh, B101, a Shelly mixed tank only works if they're surface or mid-column swimmers. Yeah. Or you've got a big tank, like a, a four-foot uh, four tank, and you've got a bunch of rocks on one side. You can put the rock dwellers like the Ornatus, like the Julia Chromis or the Lelupi or something. But I would agree with you. I, I really like to try to keep my shell dweller species only tanks because you get a lot of you get a lot of breeding too jimmy says i'm having an ammonia problem post ick treatment i have been dumping beneficial bacteria almost daily and i cannot get it down even after water changes all right so you're doing the right so ammonia you're things you can do keep adding the beneficial bacteria Keep doing the water changes. I know it's a pain. I know it's like, this is a waste of my time. Sometimes what people don't realize is the, the water changes have to be huge, right? So if I've got a, an ammonia issue, the water changes that I'm doing are probably going to be in the neighborhood of 50 to 75% every couple of days. That will certainly help control it. Cut down on your feeding, all right? So uh, we're going to need to do that because the less food the fish are eating, the less ammonia they're going to produce. So that will help. And... 
hopefully within you know you said post ick treatment so there was beneficial bacteria there there's still beneficial bacteria in the tank now it's just a matter of getting them back up to levels that can contribute to no ammonia so keep you're on the right track all right everybody i think we are going to call it a night because it's been a while it seems about that time i am going to uh, we'll be back and i am Hoping, well, yeah, we're not playing next week unless they score 12 runs in this inning. Nope, they didn't. Okay, game over. So we will, Joanna and I will be back same time, same place next Wednesday. I hope to see you there. She'll be back. Appreciate you being here. Thank you to everybody who is here, moderators, and for all the super chats and new members. Have a great week, and we'll see you next week.